بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم خوش آمدید مائی نیم از زہرا شریف اینڈ آن بہاف آف اطرا فار پاکستان اٹ از مائی پلیجر ٹو ویلکم یو آل ٹو دس سیشن ٹوڈے آن امام علی علیہ السلام اینڈ دا پرنسپل رحما ان دا ہولی قرآن بیفور آئی انٹروڈیوس آور اسٹیم اسپیکر آئی تھینک یو آل فار جوائننگ اس ٹوڈے اینڈ آئی انکریج یو ٹو انٹریکٹ ود اس Leave us your comments and questions in the comments box. We will have time for a brief Q&A segment towards the end of the talk. I hope you will give us your precious time at the end of the session and fill out feedback forms for our team. Thank you. Without further ado, let me introduce our prestigious speaker for this evening, Dr. Reza Shah Qazmi. Dr. Reza Shah Qazmi is currently a senior research associate at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London. He has written several books on comparative religion and Islamic studies, including three books on Imam Ali. His fourth book on Imam Ali, entitled A Blessed Peacemaker, Imam Ali and the Inner Paths of Shia Sunni Unity, is to be published in 2021. Also forthcoming is a book on Muslim Christian dialogue entitled Muslim Perspectives on Christian Mysteries the Incarnation the Crucifixion and the Trinity His talk this evening will draw our attention to the ways in which Imam Ali's perspectives help us appreciate more deeply the merciful essence of the Quranic discourse as encapsulated in the words my mercy embraces all surah 7 ayah 156 with a big round of virtual applause i request dr reza shakazmi to deliver this talk thank you thank you very much well i'm i'm hearing all of the sound of this virtual applause now um it's coming alhamdulillah um thank you zahra um what i will try and do in this talk is go over some of the most essential aspects of the merciful essence of the Quranic message and of the Quranic energy not just a doctrinal message but a a powerful transformative energy of rahma and how it is that imam ali alayhi salam wa karram allah wajhahu helps us to appreciate more deeply those aspects of the quranic haqiqa the reality of the quran so i'm what i'm going to do is ask zahra if you could put the um the powerpoint presentation the slides dominant on this so i could thank you um and that's the title imam ali in the holy quran a message of rahma um and we'll go to the first slide please oh, i mean after this one yes so i'm sure all of you know the hadith al thaqalain uh the hadith of the two treasures um the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam said that i'm leaving behind two weighty things thaqalain weight here in the sense of momentous with gravitas not just weight in terms of heaviness but gravitas and something that is to be regarded as a treasure and these two treasures are the holy quran and my itra my ahlul bayt and he said these two will never be parted from each other until they return to me at the paradisal pool al khawd and it's quite remarkable that there is a strong hadith also that talks about the quran as being with ali and ali with the quran in exactly the same way that the two of them will not separate until they return to me at the paradisal pool of hold so in a certain sense imam ali <coughs> is the itra is the ahl al-bayt just as fatima is just as hussein is each of them encapsulates this whole all of this progeny this of shurafa of sayyids streaming from the loins of the holy prophet and 
in fact, it's very mysterious that Imam Ali doesn't spring from the loins of the Holy Prophet. He's his first cousin. And this is one of the reasons why we have in the tradition so many sayings pertaining to the identity, the essential identity between the Prophet and Ali. Um, and this identity is related to what's called in the tradition the Haqiqa Muhammadiya, the Muhammadan reality, also known as the Noor Muhammadi, the Muhammadan light. And we have many <coughs> sayings attributed to the Holy Prophet in both Sunni sources and Shia sources that talk about he and Ali as being two lights from one source, two branches from the same root. Many, many sayings that refer to this. And one saying in particular that I think I'd like to uh, I'd ask all of you to keep in the back of your minds as we go through this talk is the saying in which he says to Sayyidina Ali, Oh Ali, anta minni wa ana minka. You are from me and I am from you. Very mysterious. How can one understand that? It's easy to see how Ali is from the Prophet in some sense. But how is the Prophet from Ali? Could the Prophet be saying something about the principle of Walaya, which is the Batin of Nubuwa? Walaya, which is sanctity, sanctifying power, guardianship, spiritual authority, spiritual friendship, all of these things are, are implied in this multivalent, polyvalent term, Walaya. Could the Prophet be saying something about the fact that the essence of prophethood, the quintessence of prophethood, the Batin, the hidden reality of Nubuwa is Walaya. And therefore, when we talk about these two principles, these two manifestations, one of Walaya as such, the other of Nubuwa as such, which comprises Walaya, are we actually talking about a personification in two forms of one and the same principle? Walaya in the center, the heart, and Nubuwa which surrounds this heart like a body. The Prophet is like the body with the heart of Walaya. Imam Ali is just the body of Walaya. He is not a Nabi. He has no Nubuwa. These are mysteries that we should keep in the back of our minds as we go on. Uh, the Prophet said also, one of you will struggle for the Ta'wil as I have struggled for the Tanzil. It's a complementarity. The, the Ta'wil is the inner esoteric interpretation literally going back to al-awwal, going back to the beginning, the source from which the word descended. And the descent itself is the tanzil. So the Prophet said, I have fought for this Quran to be brought into this world, the tanzil, the coming down, the revelation. But one of you will fight for the ta'wil. And one companion said, is it me? Another one said, is it me? He said, no, it's the one who's fixing my sandal and at that point imam ali was outside of the circle fixing the prophet's sandal so again mo all nearly all of the hadith that i refer to in this talk and in my in the writings and so on the overwhelming majority are found in standard sunni sources um, imam ali is the one who will fight for the spiritual esoteric interpretation. And that fight, as we'll see soon, is not necessarily an outward one at all. It's all about struggling to help people to make a similar struggle to go from the letter to the spirit of the revelation. And it involves a struggle intellectually, but also morally and spiritually. In what we will see, we refer to as the jihad, uh, the prophet referred to as al-jihad al-akbar the greatest holy, the greatest war, the greatest jihad, the inner struggle. So I've just put at the bottom of that slide, Ghadir, Mawla, of course, all of you know, but just to remind you um, that at Ghadir Khum, uh, just a few months before he died on the final pilgrimage, 
coming back from Mecca to Medina, he stopped, the Prophet stopped this caravan of thousands of returning pilgrims and had a, a makeshift pulpit established and he raised Ali's hand and said to the thousands present, Man kun, a little sermon, and then the most essential part of it was, Man kuntu maulahu fahada aliyun maulahu. Whoever considers me his maula, his guide, his master, must consider Ali his master, his guide. It was a clear designation of Imam Ali as the preeminent spiritual authority for the community after the Prophet's passing away. Whether it implied that he would be the political successor, it's open to debate, from different points of view on this, of course. Zahra, can we go to the next slide, please? So, um, He's also referred to, Imam Ali is also referred to by the Prophet as the gate to the city of prophetic consciousness. Ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha. I am the city of knowledge and Ali is her gate, her doorway. And whoever wishes to have knowledge, let him come to the gate. This is also part of that hadith. So what is the essence of this prophetic knowledge, this prophetic consciousness? It is, of course, knowledge of God, his essence, his attributes, his names, his qualities, his acts, his revelations. All of this is part of saying what it is that the prophet knows directly from God. And what the prophet, therefore, sees, as it were, with the eye of the heart, is that the essence of this divine nature that he knows is Rahma. This is clearly expressed in verse 110 of the Surah Al Isra, number 17, as we have there. Call upon Allah or call upon Ar Rahman. Ud or Rahman. It's as if the Quran is saying that whether you call upon Allah or upon Ar Rahman, those two names designate the same essential nature and what is that nature because Allah simply means the one who's worshipped it doesn't tell you what the nature of this object of worship is but what tells you something about the nature of this supreme object that we are worshipping we are told that it is a rahman that rahma defines to the extent that the essence of god the nature of god can be defined that Ar-Rahman defines the essence, essential nature, let's say that, the essential nature of God. To the extent that that nature can be defined in terms of qualities which it transcends, the one quality that seems to stand out and say this is the essential nature of the divine, the sov what Plato calls the sovereign good, to agathon, Ar-Rahman. So this is basically what we're going to be talking about. And there's a Hadith Qudsi that says, I have derived my name Ar-Rahman from Rahim, the word for womb. That we don't have, I don't have transliteration on this PowerPoint, but that word is Rahim, not Rahim, which is another name of God. But Rahim, which means womb. I have derived my name Ar-Rahman from this word for the woman's womb. Whence, I put at the bottom of the slide, whence the prophetic evocation, not definition, it's impossible to define something like Rahma, but we can evoke it. The prophet helped us to, to he suggested, he evoked, he intimated at this qualitative aspect of the divine nature, which is Rahma, by giving us a most wonderful analogy. And this is at the peaceful conquest of Mecca, when a woman was seen frantically running, looking for her baby, whom she had lost. And when she found her baby, she put the baby to her breast, and the Prophet and his companions were present. And he turned to the companions and said, do you see what Rahma this mother shows to her baby? And they said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, SubhanAllah, MashaAllah. 
And then he said, Allah has more rahmah for you on the day of judgment than this woman has for her child. So the Prophet is encouraging us to make an analogy between this womb, Rahim, the mother who's just given birth, the totality of Rahmah, the totality of love and compassion and mercy and goodness and beatitude, that totality of the organic relationship that unites the mother to the newborn child. He's saying that if we can bring all of that to mind and then magnify it, incommensurably infinitely greater is the relationship that god has to us that is what our rahman and our rahim is like to us but on an infinitely greater scale and that's for us to make that leap of imagination with with our heart to go from something so marvelous as the love that the mother has for her newborn babe to going to the love that Allah has for all of us in, in, in a way that's much more than just forgiveness, compassion, mercy, which is normally what we think of, Rahman, Rahim. But it's much, much more than that because it's what defines the relationship between the mother and the newborn babe is much more all-encompassing, organic, total, existential, ontological love within which is comprised compassion and mercy and forgiveness and these other things. So Rahmah is much more um, evocatively described and defined in terms of love than just simply by forgiveness and mercy. Right, so can we go to the next slide, please? The transformative power of the Quran. Before we go into the message of, of Rahmah in the Quran, but we need to have some angles of entry. And this is why um, I've chosen to talk about Imam Ali's perspectives on the Quran as angles of entry into this. The Book of God, he says, is that by means of which you see, the means by which you speak, the means by which you hear. Now, that is almost identical to the description given of the Wali Allah, the friend of God, when in one of the most important and oft cited sayings in the Sufi tradition, certainly, is when the, in the I will only talk about the second part of this, that, um, well, the first part is important, it sets the context, is that, that my slave comes closer to me by nothing that I love more than what I have made binding upon him. Mimma ftaratu alayh, the faraid. My slave comes closer to me, closer to me, doesn't cease coming close to me. By this thing that I love so much, I love nothing more than this. But then the second part says, but my slave does not cease to come closer to me through nawafil, through acts of devotion, that go beyond the legal uh, obligations. These are supererogatory prayers, total devotion, understood in the tradition to be dhikrullah, continuous invocation, and not just a multiplication of the outward rites, but the um, total dedication to the inward transformative rite par excellence, which Imam Ali referred to as the means by which you polish your heart. Um, and perhaps we'll just mention that quickly. Um, there is a, a saying of the Holy Prophet to the same effect, For everything there is a polish, and the means of polishing the hearts is dhikrullah. And Imam Ali relates this more specifically to the principle of light and to the ayatul nur by um, citing the verse that comes immediately after the ayatul nur, he refers to these rijal, which in Arabic does not just mean men in a gendered sense, it means spiritually virile individuals, men and women. These people 
are ones who invoke the name of God and are not distracted from the invocation by their involvement in trade and merchandise. La tulhihim tijaratun wa la bay'un an dhikrillah. And then he, his comment, I think this is Sermon 213, if my memory serves me correctly, in most editions of the Natural Balaha, that Imam Ali says that, Inna Allaha ja'ala dhikra jila'an lil qulub. Truly God has made the dhikr, the invocation of the divine name, a polish for the hearts, by means of which the hearts come to see after being blind, hear after being deaf, and yield with submission after being resistant, and tight and contracted. Um, so the dhikr is the, the most important spiritual practice for the Sufis. And um, they relate this practice to the second part of the, well, of the Hadith and Nawafil, where God has said that my, save, my slave comes closer to me, my nothing I love more, than what I've made incumbent upon him. But he does not cease to come closer to me by the nawafil, understood as the dhikr, until I love him. And when I love him, I become the hearing by which he hears, the sight by which he sees, the foot on which he walks, the hand with which he smites. And that expression of what is called ittihad, or, or more properly tawheed, mystical union, the highest meaning of Tawheed, when the multiplicity of this individual soul, intellect, spirit is unified in the, uh, within the divine transformative energy so that God not becomes the faculties, but that God takes away the veil from which prevents us from seeing that he is our vision, our hearing. He's everything that we see, everything that we hear, and he is the means by which we hear and see. He's the means by which we understand, and he is that which we are trying to understand. So it's the taking away of a veil to reveal the actual reality that there is no witness, there is no agent, there is no being except God in existence. So Imam Ali is now making a very interesting um, relationship between what the Book of God does and what the transformative love of God does when you are polishing your heart up with the dhikr and God, as it were, becomes your hearing. God as invades all of your faculties of perception, enabling you to see with the eye of God and therefore to see God through God. That's the, one of the great things that Imam Ali says, that you cannot know God except through God. You cannot see God except through God. Now, what is this mystery of the Quranic energy that makes it quasi-identical to the love that is referred to in the Hadith Nawafil that allows the slave, God loves this servant who's devoted himself totally through the remembrance of God so that now the slave is hearing and seeing and speaking through the divine. Here, this transformative energy, a theurgic power, that which makes God's presence all the more fulgurating and irresistible theurgic power, is given in this saying, who, uh, no, um, the previous one, sorry, we haven't come to it yet. Imam Ali says, whosoever recites the Quran, it is as if prophethood is being woven into his very being, except that he will not become a prophet. Ka'annama udrijat an-nubuwa bainijambehi. It's as if nubuwa is being woven, is being caused by degrees to enter into your very body, except you will not become prophet. So what is it that ka'anna, it's as if prophethood is coming into you, but you will not become a prophet? It can be described as walaya, which is, as we've said, the batin of nubuwa, the essence of nubuwa is coming to you. You can become a waliullah in walaya muktasaba, that kind of walaya that you can earn 
through your actions, intentions, and your virtues, your spiritual discipline, then the grace of God may be given to you to become a waliullah, but you will never be given a grace that will make you a nabi of Allah. So this is, it seems that this is what the power of the Quran can do, and the greatest aspects of its mercy, if you like, is that it not only has the power to grant you salvation in the hereafter, it grants you the ability, the capacity to receive the sanctifying graces and become a waliullah in this life, which is a prefiguration of salvation in the next life. So now we can go to the next slide, please. Yes, I've referred again to theurgic power, and I'm quoting myself, Astaghfirullah, but I just thought I won't be able to repeat, I haven't learned this sentence off by heart, so I just want to read it. The whole being, and not just the mind, the whole being of one who is attuned to the divine music of the Quran is opened up, the whole being is opened up to the spiritual power of the revelation. The theurgic power unleashed by an inimitable symbiosis of sensible sound and intelligible light. Sonoral presence of the sacred and enlightening exposition of the truth. So we've got something sensible. It's, it's coming in through the senses. We hear this divine music and it makes the sacred present with this sonoral resonance combined with an enlightening exposition of the truth. So you've got the truth expressed in very simple words often and elliptical words which call which summon up the depths of your intelligence to come up and try and understand the implications of what's being said to go from the immediate meaning to the deeper meanings in accordance with the depth of your own attunement to the quran and here what rumi says is quite significant that people complain Saying that, you know, I studied the Quran, I try and reflect upon it, I recite it, but I get nothing out of it. And Rumi says, the trouble with you is that you are, this is not in Maslavi, this is in the Kitab Fihi Ma Fihi, the discourses. He said, the trouble with you is you're like a person who is going to a bride and trying to pull away her veil on her wedding night. She will not allow that. She will wait until you do what she wants you to do. He uses the image of plowing a field. You've got to go away and work. You've got to plow up the soil of your soul, churn yourself up, do what the Quran wants you to do, conform to the Quranic spirituality and ethical perfection. And then the more you do that, the more you will receive, the more she will unveil herself. And then you'll see the beauty of what you are trying to um, prematurely look at and to rip the veil instead of actually saying allow me to serve you and then you will lift the veil in your own good time so let's go to the next slide please so now the rahmah the holy quran um another saying of imam ali that helps us have an angle of entry into this is the quran is in the fatiha the fatiha is in the basmala the basmala is in the bar. The bar is in the dot. And I am the dot. I am that dot. We have here two distinct but related meanings. One is that the whole message of the Quran is a message of Rahmah. Why? Because if the whole of the Quran is in the Fatiha, and the whole of the Fatiha that contains the Quran is in the basmala, let's stop there for a moment. What is the basmala? In the name of God. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. So, um, these two names of mercy, of compassion, of love, are the are indicators of 
what the Quran as a whole is all about. Because if the whole of the Quran is in the Fatiha, and the Fatiha is in the Basmala, and the Basmala is all about mercy, compassion, and Rahmah, it means that the Quran is nothing but an ocean of Rahmah. And it's up to us to navigate this ocean, to swim in it, and to take in all of this Rahmah, even if there are some parts of this ocean that we see, we don't quite understand how is this related to Rahmah when it describes, for example, the punishments of hell. That's one of the challenges that we have, and which we'll come to in a moment. So there are two distinct messages, messages, meanings. The message of the Quran is a message of Rahmah. And secondly, the Waliullah is the symbol both of revelation and of creation. If Imam Ali is saying, I am the dot beneath the bar, and that bar contains the Basmala, which contains the Fatiha, which contains the Quran, this the Waliullah, this point, this geometrical point, is at one with the infinite expanse of the divine nature as Rahma and of the whole of the creation. Because Imam Ali says that Allah has revealed himself to his creatures, through his creatures, through the whole of the creation, but they don't see him. Just like he has revealed himself, but using the word tajalli, not tanzil, but tajalli is a kind of self-disclosure, self-revelation, not a message about me, but what I really am. I reveal myself, that's tajalli, and that's what the waliullah is, a disclosure of God, what the cosmos is, and what the Quran is, as the quintessence of all revelations. So let's go to the next slide, please. I am the dot. So the Quran, oh, we've already got that, sorry, mistake on my part. So the rahmah of the basmala is on the one hand the infinitude of the Quranic revelation, and on this other hand, the absoluteness of the geometric point. It would take me a rather a long time to explain exactly what I mean here, but we're running a little bit short of time. So let's go to the next slide. Rahma in the Quran, my mercy encompasses all. So now that we've got this, hopefully um, a little bit of a, of a prelude to the discussion of Rahma in the Quran through Imam Ali's um, wonderful sayings, let's go um, dive into this this uh, verse from the Surah Al-A'raf, the Heights, Surah number 7, verse 156. My mercy encompasses all things. Rahmati wasi'at kull shayn. I say here there are three aspects of all encompassing. How is this mercy encompassing all things? There are three aspects. Creation, redemption, realization. One, creation. The Ar-Rahman is the source of the cosmos. It's Ar-Rahman who creates in the Quran again and again and again. We have this. Khalaq um, al-Insan. It's Ar-Rahman who created hum the human being. So the whole of the cosmos, having been created by Ar-Rahman, is contained, as it were, within the womb of divine mercy. We have this image of the, the whole of the cosmos streaming forth from Ar-Rahman, but never leaving the perimeter, if you like, of the divine nature. And that perimeter is, is like the surrounding the womb within which all seeds and manifestations of creation are contained. So God's mercy encompasses the whole of the creation that Ar-Rahman has brought into being. The second is redemption by Ar-Rahim. It's said in the tradition that Ar-Rahman creates and Ar-Rahim saves. So creative manifestation by Ar-Rahman and saving redemption by Ar-Rahim. All are ultimately saved by God's mercy. And this is the aspect that we're going to go into shortly. Um, how is it, How can we say that the mercy of God encompasses all things when we're told that hell seems to go on forever and hell cannot be encompassed by, by mercy? There's a, there's a paradox. And also, how can God's mercy encompass all and save all as Ar-Rahim 
when there are people within the Islamic tradition who argue that you have to follow the religion of Islam only in order to be saved. Where's the all-encompassing aspect of mercy there? So this is what we'll go into shortly. The third aspect is realization. And this is something I, I wish we had more time to go into, but um, uh, basically Imam Ali gives us this image of the Jihad al-Akbar, the spiritual inner battle against one's own vices, weaknesses, and imperfections by saying that one, ha one can envisage the soul as a battleground. And on one side of the soul is the apple, on the other side of the soul is hawa, intellect versus desire. Desire in the negative, subjective, personalistic, egotistic, let's call it egotistic desire. And the intellect, objective intellect, they're fighting it out in the soul. And they represent, on the one hand, Ar-Rahman, the intellect is defined by Imam Ali as the commander of the forces of Ar-Rahman in this great inner battle. And Hawa, egotistical desire, represents and commands the forces of Ash-Shaitan. So you have Ash-Shaitan and Ar-Rahman opposed to each other up here, if you like, in this graphic representation. And on the level of the soul, you have the intellect fighting against ego, the ego. The ego manifesting itself as hawa, as desire. The ego that's described in the Quran as the nafs al-amara, the commanding, dictating soul that commands to evil. So this forceful entity within us is opposed by the intellect within us. And they represent and reflect and command the forces of Ar-Rahman and Ash-Shaitan. Now you would think that in this great holy war, inwardly, the force that should oppose Shaitan is one of the powerful names of God, Al-Qahar or Al-Qawi, the strong, the conquering, Al-Ghalib. But no. The power of God that comes to the help of the soul in this battle is a rahman loving, gentle, kind, compassion and mercy, which is a tremendous indication of the infinite power that comes from compassion and love. And it's that power that can overcome shaitan and the ego that is striving to assert itself within us. It's not some kind of of, of, of self-willed power that I must fight against this. It's I, my intellect, must completely submit and give in to the principle of loving, compassion and mercy in order for the intellect to be empowered in its battle against egotism, which is the very opposite of Ar-Rahman, and which represents and reflects shaitan. So, um, in this jihad, the success, as it were, in this jihad is summed up in the saying of the Prophet, I was only raised up for you as a prophet for the sake of perfecting the most noble traits of character. Makarim al-Akhlaq. It's an incredible statement. Only raised up. Inna ma bu'ithtu li'utammima makarim al-Akhlaq. How is it that the whole prophetic mission can be summed up in terms of purpose and aim and goal as being the perfecting of noble character traits? Does that mean that everything about theology, metaphysics, mysticism, moral guidance, of course, is there? And all of these so-called, you know, these higher aspects of religious teachings, are they all somehow going to unfold spontaneously within the heart to the extent that the character is perfected, is improved? That's a, it's a question for us to ponder, because the Prophet wouldn't have used this word, innama. I only was raised up for you. This is my only reason for coming. We have to think about that. Let's go on to the next slide. 
so yes now um how long do we have left um we, is this 40 minutes there does that mean that i should be finishing in 20 minutes uh, zahra we, we you would have about 20 25 minutes yes oh, all right thank you, you do have thank time. You. all right good yes because i want to get through these eight questions um and since we only have 20 minutes to do this i will unfortunately have to be very schematic and brief in my my uh, comments on each of these um so now the irony is that the most universal revelation whose merciful nature extends to all religions is being paraded as the most fanatically exclusivist it's a terrible irony that the islamic revelation the quran itself is among all the world scriptures this isn't entering into some kind of competitive religion as opposed to comparative religion but it's just a statement of fact that the quran coming at the end of the cycle of prophetic revelation perforce sums up all previous revelations and has this all-embracing inclusive aspect to it and this aspect has pretty much been as my late teacher dr martin ling's uh, used to say for centuries and centuries the quran has been shouted down by the commentators the mufassirun that the commentators have been shouting down the literal explicit self-evident meaning of the universal embrace of all religions that you find in the quran and for centuries the commentators have been saying oh no no but this is abrogated by that this is annulled by that and dr Lings would have none, none of that and he encouraged us to be very forthright if not robust in our presentation of the universal message of the quran um so imagine that you are in an interview um now why am i sorry i should preface this just by quickly saying that uh, to go back to what we were saying earlier about the all embracing you know if god's mercy embraces all what is there in the quran for people of other faiths who do not believe in islam who follow some other religion does god's mercy encompass them as well does it embrace them and i say yes emphatically unequivocally explicitly self-evidently and look at these just simple questions imagine yourself as being interviewed by somebody if you're a muslim and the interviewer is not he says to you look i want to know about your religion i'm going to ask you eight basic questions about your revelation and i want you to give me an answer using just one verse or a group of verses or a fragment of a verse to answer these questions basic questions about religion but what i want you all to focus on is the extraordinary way in which a straightforward simple answer to a simple question nearly always opens out into universality into mercy into embracing all so let's go to the first question please Zafra. question one what is your creed what is it that you believe and if we had to choose just one verse we would choose this one 285 of surah al-baqarah the messenger believes in that which has been revealed unto him from his lord and so do the believers and what is it that we all believe what is it that the messenger believes what is it that god has revealed to him and to us and that we believe in we all believe in god and god's angels and god's scriptures in the plural not just the quran and god's messengers in the plural rusulihi and then what do we say if we are true to this all embracing merciful encompassment of the religious phenomenon from the beginning of time to now and for the whole of the geographical space wherever from china to the the americas we say 
We make no distinction between any of his messengers. La bayna ahadin min rusulihi. We don't make any distinguish, distinction at all. We have to embrace, if we believe in this revelation, as does the Prophet, if we believe in this, we have to say this. La nufarriku. We don't make any difference between all of these messengers. They're coming with the same essential message and we embrace all of them. God wants us to be all embracing vis-a-vis -vis the prophets and messengers of all the traditions. Let's go to the next slide, please. Question two, according to your faith, who is saved? This is probably the most important question from the point of view of, of universal salvation and of God's mercy encompassing all. We would choose this verse. 62 from Surah Al-Baqarah, and it's almost verbatim in the Surah Al-Ma'idah also, which interestingly is the, uh, the, the final revelation. It's close to being one of the final revelations. And therefore, it's very difficult logically for the Mufassirun, the commentator, to say 262 is abrogated by 385 which we'll, we may come to later. Very difficult because the section in Surah Al-Ma'idah, which is almost verbatim with this verse, that came after the apparently abrogating verse in 385. Anyway, so this is 262. Truly those who believe, and the Jews, and the Christians, and the Sabians, whoever believes in God and the last day and performs virtuous deeds, surely their reward is with their Lord. No fear shall come upon them neither shall they suffer. It's as if God doesn't want to give you a list of all of the religions and the, the philosophical traditions that flow from original prophetic revelation like the Platonic tradition. It's as if God is saying, use your own intelligence. Now I'm telling you about the people that you've come into contact with, the Jews, the Christians, the Sabians, who are Neoplatonist, sort of uh, Neoplatonists from Haran, according to the scholars. Um, but it's like an open-ended category that anything that you don't know about, you can sort of say, well, if the Sabians are included here, then we should be quite broad-minded about, for example, including Zoroastrians as people of the book, or Taoists, and as I've argued in a book um, called Common Ground Between Islam and Buddhism, I'm saying that we can regard the Buddhists as being people of the book based on clear um, verses of the Quran, such as these ones that are encouraging us to use our intelligence to say, whoever believes in God and the last day and performs virtuous deeds. Man amana billah wal yawmal akhir wa aminu salihat. Very, very simple. Belief in the absolute, accountability to the absolute, and then action that is consequent upon those two beliefs virtuous action if we really believe in the absolute and that we believe we are accountable to the absolute then virtuous deeds will be the inevitable concomitant in to the degree that our faith in god and judgment is sincere then virtue will stream forth spontaneously these people who believe in the absolute and the last day and who perform virtuous deeds, jaza'uhum inda rabbihim, their reward is with their Lord. La khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. They have no fear about the future. They have no suffering or grief about the past. They're plunged into the present moment of God's eternal beatitude. That's one way we can understand the Sufi definition of, of, the, of, of the Sufi, Ibn al-Waqt, the son of the moment. That they are plunged in this moment, this moment belongs to God, the moment is eternal. And that eternal beatitude is paradise. You can enter paradise here and now to the extent that you have had another verse that talks like this about fear and grief. Is it not the fact that the, the friends of God are those who have no fear and no grief? So the friends of God, and Imam Ali says, I belong to a group of people whose hearts are already in paradise and whose bodies are just working in this world. That's what this verse is all about. That the reward that you get from your Lord to the degree that your faith is sincere, your iman becomes iqan, 
your faith becomes certainty and your certainty opens you up to sanctity, then what happens? You have no fear of the future, no grief about the past. You're in the present moment, which is eternal beatitude. You have your reward from your Lord here in this very world. One of the most subtle meanings of, of Imam Ali's um, saying that the hearts of the friends are in, this, in a relationship of ta'alluq with the highest domain. Well, we could go on a lot. Now I see that we're on to 50 minutes. So let's go on to the next question. I really want to get through these eight. Why is there a diversity of faiths? A question that you could ask any religious believer who believes his or her religion is true and salvific. Well, why are there so many faiths? What does your religion say about this? Again, we have this merciful answer from the Quran. 548 Surah al Ma'idah. For each we have appointed a law, shir'a, and a way, minhaj. If God had willed, he could have made you one ummah. لَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ لَجَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً وَلَكِنْ لِيَبَلُّوَكُمْ فِي مَا أَتَاكُمْ But in order that he might try you, give you a test, in terms of what he has given you, he's made you as you are, different ummas, with different revelations. So then the next statement, so compete with, the, with one another in good works. This is what the Dalai Lama said, healthy competition. He encouraged believers to engage in healthy competition of better meditation, longer time in meditation, more compassionate action. It's exactly what the Dalai Lama says. And again, I've mentioned that in that book, Common Ground Between Islam and Buddhism. Compete with each other in good works. Astabakul khayrat. Unto God you will all return, and he will inform you of the truth concerning your differences of opinion. There are going to be ikhtilaf of of uh, ara of opinions this one thinks that this one thinks that this will have an argument but god is saying look leave all those things your differences to the hereafter you're not going to solve all these problems all these differences between you but you will see everything as it really is on the day of judgment and, and once you've passed away from this world when the veil of this world the veil of your own uh, ignorance and passion has been taken from you and you see with the eye of God with an intellect unveiled at the end of this life you will see everything in its proper light and uh, you will see that you are disputing about things that were of absolutely no significance let's go to the next slide please Zara Question four, what is the essence of the message? What, what is the essence of your religion as expressed in your scripture? Here we will choose verse 25 of the Surah Al-Anbiya 21, very appropriately for this verse. We sent no messenger before you, but that we inspired him saying, there is no God except me, so worship me. So every single messenger came with an identical message in essence, but with a differentiated message of form. So why is this merciful? Because it means that to the extent that we are attuned to the essence of the religious message, in that very measure we can embrace with love and mercy and compassion all of our fellow believers. But to the extent that we are fixated on the differentiation of form, in that same measure, we will be saying, oh, well, you know, I can't accept that and I can't do this. You know, it's all negation, all exclusion. But there's affirmation and inclusion with mercy and love and compassion to the extent that we attune ourselves to the essence of this message as expressed in this verse. Can we have the next slide, please? To whom is this message addressed? Very simple answer. For every ummah, there is a messenger. Now, is China an ummah? Of course it is. Therefore, it must have had not a messenger. If they're a quarter of the world's population, they've had many, many messengers, even if it's not mentioned in the Quran. So we use our intelligence, we use our spiritual sensibility, we reflect, we absorb, we think, and then we say, yes, of course, Confucius. Lao Tzu, Chuang Tzu, these are the messengers for that Ummah. Let's embrace them 
with gratitude. And with regard to the believers in those traditions, we have an all-encompassing love for them in accordance with Rahman. Let's go into the next question, please. What does your scripture say about religious exclusivism? In response to the claim by certain groups among Jews and Christians that they alone go to paradise, there's some groups among the Jewish and the Christian tradition, they say we are the chosen people on the basis of certain verses in their scriptures, that we alone go to paradise. And the Muslims obviously encountered this at the time of the revelation and they uh, were told how to respond they the quran says tilka amani yuhum. these claims they're making are simple vain desires the muslims are told to respond as follows say bring your proof if you're truthful nay but whoever submits his purpose to God, man aslama wajhahu lillah. Aslama here in the verbal sense of making submission of your face, literally, but meaning the whole of your being. Whoever submits their whole being to God and they have virtue, their reward will be with their Lord. No fear or grief will befall them. Exactly the same idea that before we had suffering, but here I've left it as grief. It's the same word, it's huzm. So we have no place for religious polemics and exclusivism and saying we alone go to paradise and this and that. that that's not for us. We are not permitted to enter into that game of polemics and jadal, disputation. That's not for us. For us is the opposite. I think the next, uh, can we go to the next slide? I think that says about dialogue. Zahra, can we go to question seven? What does your scripture say about religious dialogue? This is the counterpart to that first question six. Beautiful verse 125 of Surah 16 and Nahal. This is what we're supposed to do. Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal ma'aidatil hasan. Call unto the way of your Lord. Do the da'wah. Udur, make the call. But how do you call to the way of your Lord? You do it with wisdom. With hikmah. Wal ma'u'idha hasana. And with beautiful exhortation. With fine exhortation. Engaging in discourse with them. With other, with people of other faiths. In a way which is ahsan. Which is most beautiful. 16.25. Now, we only have a minute and 45 seconds left for the final slide, which is about warfare. Can we go to the next slide, please, Zahra? No, Teresa, you can take your time to definitely complete all the questions. Well, this is, this is the last one. Thank you very much. But this is, thankfully, the last one. And, uh, and I think one hour is is enough for, for speaking and then I, I need we'll have how many question uh, minutes for question and answer we will have about 15 to 20 minutes so oh, we'll okay. try to cover at least two or three questions very good very good so this is a very very important aspect of the merciful message of the quran because of course most people when you mention today the quran muslims the first thing they think of is fighting against non-muslims and it's the very opposite of what we are told in the Quran to do. Yes, there are other verses that are in the context of a war that's been that's begun and so on and so forth. But if we want to go to the heart of the motivation, the spirit of the injunctions relating to warfare, we should regard this as altogether definitive. It defines the context and the function of the other verses pertaining to warfare. Instead of marginalizing this kind of verse and saying, oh, no, no, the Quran is all about warfare because look what it says here about slay them wherever you find them, the, the, the sword verse and so on. That's what you call cherry picking. You say, well, yes, that is what the Quran's all about. And they would not mention this, or if they do, they say, oh, no, but that was abrogated or something. The people who look at it from the outside. It's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. 
but to say which are the verses that are of more universal import which are the verses that help us to define the other ones in terms of function and context what are the definitive verses in the quran and what are the secondary ones the essential definitive ones are this kind of verse that touch the spirit touch the heart and say ah so this is the reason why we're doing it and therefore we think oh yes all the other ones that talk about don't take the jews and the christians as your allies then what do we do we think oh, what can this mean let's look at the context and then compare it to the spirit of this verse what that means it's a verse that's always cited take not the jews and the christians as awliya min dunil mu'minin or muslimin do not take the christians and the jews as allies it was a specific injunction in a battle when some of the hypocrites in medina were secretly making alliances with christians and jewish groups against the muslims so that's the thing so do you universalize that or do you contextualize it of course you contextualize it and you universalize verses like this these two 39 to 40 in answer to this question what is the purpose of warfare in your faith and look at the way in which mercy and compassion and love define the essence of this motivation of fighting permission to fight is given to those who are being fought it's very important it's a fatha. permission is given to those who are being fought against the passive so defense is the absolute imperative here it's not offensive warfare permission to fight is given to those who are being fought for they have been wronged and then it goes on in the following verse if god had not driven back some by means of others then monasteries churches synagogues and mosques wherein the name of god is much invoked now what that means is the name of god is invoked is called upon the name of god even in these different languages of christianity and judaism but is always the name of god it's always the essential nature of the divine that's being called upon whatever be the languages ritual liturgical and other they are referring to the same reality they are invoking the absolute in monasteries that be our own and in churches and synagogues salawat on and then the last thing is mosques why does god put mosques at the end if islam is all about propagating itself and destroying others why not put mosques at the beginning and then well also these others no it's as if god is telling us look you've got to think of these places where monks and nuns live in peace and are seeking their lord you have to protect those places you have to protect the churches you have to protect the synagogues as well as the mosques wherein the name of god is much invoked if we don't do this then these places will be destroyed by people who want nothing but malevolence against religion religion in the singular all religious believers so what we have to have is a corresponding view of all religious believers as constituting one ummah yes we have different religious communities within the ummah but in the surah i think it's in the surah of the prophets again after mentioning the whole list of prophets it says this your ummah is one ummah ummatan wahidatan this is one ummah you all belong to this religious community that is defined by the messengers and the prophets of those communities we are all one we are all together and um if we are true if we want to be true to the merciful all-encompassing message and energy of the quran we have to take into account verses such as these and to reflect that rahma in our own lives and in our dealings with our fellow human beings to the best of our ability right i've gone over one hour but at least we'll have uh, 15 or 20 minutes for questions and so I'm That's absolutely thank you dr Reza. you were relevant in the time and we do have a little bit of time to take a couple of questions 
the first question will uh, begin um, sort of where you kind of left off with that eighth question, with the, uh, the eighth question you posed. Uh, and the question is, I appreciate the usage of individual verses of the Holy Quran as proof text and letting the scripture speak for such critical questions. But don't you think that this approach can also be exploited easily? For instance, one can ask what sort of relationship should exist between Muslims, Jews, and Christians? The response from Surah 5, Ayah 51, O oh believers, do not take Jews and Christians as allies. They are in fact allies of one another. And whoever is an ally to them among you is one of them. Mm, well, I think that's going to be the person who I, I can't hear. Uh, Were you able to hear the first question? I, I, I could. The person who wrote that question obviously wrote it before the talk because I addressed that question in the talk and I said precisely that there are verses that are apparently negative vis-a-vis -vis other communities. Do we, with our intelligence, do we use those verses to define the context and the function of the verses that talk about mercy and compassion? Or do we use the, the verses of mercy and compassion and understanding and opening to define the context of the other verses? So I've, I've answered that question and the person either wasn't listening to the talk or had written it before and anyway so let's go to the next question all right we'll go to the next one uh, dr reza you have very well explained the principle of rahma discussing the pouring of god's infinite mercy and the analogy of the womb you have also elaborated in your book spiritual quest on the interpretation of surah fatiha that common translations may be misleading in that it is not god who becomes angry at us. Given this context, how then can we, as youth, reconcile this overwhelming message of love, compassion, and mercy with Surah 111, Surah Al-Masad, on Abu Lahab and his wife, a Surah that appears to show no mercy, compassion, or love? Thank you. Right. That's a good question. Um, I, I wish, though, that I could see the person who asked the question, because then in my answer, I feel as if I'm, I'm relating to that person. It's very difficult in the abstract to do this, especially because it's all this, this screen business. Um, that is a very good question. And let's go back to the first part. Um, that I'm glad that the person picked up from Spiritual Quest that um, actually I don't like to see just myself. I, I'd much rather have my screen in a small place. And uh, yeah, can you include some other people in the screen as well? Zahra. Yes, Dr. Reza. Yeah. Uh, right now, I think it's just the two of us. I can try to uh, see if we can add someone else here as well. Well, two or three people, so that, uh, you know, it's sort of off putting to see myself in such a prominent way. I'm like, self conscious. So I just want to get rid of my, my the image there. All right. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just focus there. Um, yeah, I'm glad that the person notice that in spiritual quest because it's very very important that and it will help us to understand the curse against abu lahab in the surah um, al-masad um, because there is a relationship between the maghdubi alayhim at the end of the surah al-fatiha it doesn't say at the end of the Fatiha, those with whom God is angry. It says those who have incurred anger. Now, that anger, 
is not necessarily the anger of God. It's not defined. The only thing that God does in the Fatiha is an'amta alayhim, is that you, you have bestowed your ni'mah, your grace on them. And then not those who have incurred anger, who have incurred wrath, which is undefined, and not those who have strayed. Now, the maghdubi alayhim, esoterically, can mean this, that there is a category of person, and it can be a believer as well, who, on the day of judgment, is presented with his book, as we are told in the Surah Al-Isra, um, I forget which number verse it is, but the Surah number 17. On the Day of Judgment, it said in that surah that we that we will present a book. Each of us will be given a book wide open. As an, uh, and we will be told, read your own book. Iqra kitabak. Kafa bin nafsika alayka al-yawma hasiba. Your soul is sufficient, yourself is sufficient on this day as a judge to take account of your deeds. So what is being implied here is that the way in which judgment happens, the way in which God's judgment is given, is through our own intellect. That will impose, will be angry against ourselves. Let us give the case of a sinner, an Abu Lahab who insulted the Prophet, and there was a great enemy of the Prophet, blah, blah, blah. He was a vicious person and a violent person. And he dies and he goes to meet the Lord and he's given a book and he reads his book and he says, goodness, was I really like this against this messenger of God, this holy person? Abu Lahab's own intellect freed from the shackles of bodily existence and of worldly illusion will now see things as they really are the prophet said one of the greatest you know one of the greatest dua we can say based on the prophetic sunnah is rabbana arina al ashya kama hiya our lord show us things as they really are on the day of judgment when we die and each one of us has our judgment as soon as we die because the Prophet said, Man mata qad qamat qiyamatuhu. He who dies, is his qiyamah has begun. And that has an esoteric meaning, that one who has died to the nafs, died to the ego in this world, the qiyamah has, has begun. That's why Imam Ali could say, his heart's already in paradise. His qiyamah's happened because he's dead to his nafs, his ego, he's dead to the world. But he's just his body is going through and doing what needs to be done. But he's already in that paradise and domain. Now imagine the uh, Abu Lahab, a sinner, a serial killer, whoever it might be, and they they die. Their qiyama is established. They read, they look at their book. Today's imagery would probably say, "Here's a DVD. Have a look at your life. You know, this is the film of your life, not just the book." And in an instant, you will have the capacity with that intellect no longer veiled by the world and by the ego the intellect will see moment by moment every single thing that we have done speed it up in a different time and space from this world this universe and we will see exactly what we have done and can you imagine the hell into which abu lahab will go when he sees the reality of what he had done as a vicious person, that hell will be nothing other than the feeling of total guilt and remorse and shame. And it will be a psychic, not necessarily physical, but it will be much worse than a physical hell of fire and this and that. It would be a punishment inflicted upon oneself for the evil that one has done to all good people, to whatever whatever the nature of the sin is, you will get, as the, as the, as the Quran says, for every evil act that you do, you will be uh, punished the like thereof, one to one. But every good action that you do, 
the reward you'll be given is tenfold. That's an aspect of the of the mercy that enters into the process of reward and punishment, of meeting out punishment and bestowing reward. That for each sin and in the measure of the suffering caused by the sin, we will receive a corresponding suffering because of the vision that the intellect of the person will have on the day of judgment after death and that will cast that person itself to such a state of guilt that guilt will define the hell and so going back to the, the surah Al abu lahab yes these are very very strong denunciations but what are they saying is it some historical narrative about some person who insulted the prophet and fought against him and tried to kill him or is it in addition to that and more fundamentally more psychologically more if you like mythologically in the best sense of mythology more spiritually microcosmically is it not a way of expressing the absolute with which we must fight against all manifestations of egotism and vanity and pride and viciousness within ourselves the abu lahab that is within us and therefore whatever is said in such severe terms against the sinner out there has to be applied with all that rigor and force and vigilance and discernment and action against the Abu Lahab within Rumi in the Masnavi again and again he goes back to this saying that when when we read in the Quran about Moses and Pharaoh let's not think about two people in the distant past instead we have to think about the Moses of your being that is fighting the Pharaoh of your being within yourself within that battleground and how all of the actions of the prophetic consciousness symbolized by Moses vis-a-vis -vis Pharaoh, all of those actions had their corresponding microcosmic, that's inward, spiritual application. It's up to us to, to discern that and to engage in that jihad and the result of that we went back to earlier in the Bible with to a little to get rid of that part of the ego that says I am your Lord most high what Pharaoh expresses is the ultimate expression of what every ego wants to say that I am in charge I give the orders the nafs al amara tells you what to do and wants this and wants that and wants it now and wants it forever that's the ego and that's the pharaoh and the moses of your being has to con confront now how does it do it imam ali teaches us on the one hand through polishing the heart with the dhikrullah with one of the names of the prophet is dhikrullah so we're polishing our heart with rasulullah with the prophetic reality with his light polishing it up and then when it comes to forcefulness yes there has to be a total we have to say that this sin that we are committing is absolutely unforgivable and that is an expression of mercy paradoxically because if we say well you know it's a venial sin that I, you know I, yes i was being a bit vain i was being a bit egotistic but you know it wasn't that serious a sin god will forgive me what is that other than total complacency self-indulgence vanity egotism and imam ali said every act of yours every act of riya which is showing off every act of riya is a shirk is a polytheism an act of idolatrous association of a god with God, total opposite of la ilaha illallah. So in this case, you're elevating your ego to the level of, a, of an idol and you're worshiping that. And the prophet said that detecting 
that subtle inner shirk, shirk al-khafi. Detecting that inner shirk is as difficult as detecting a dark ant crawling over a black rock in the darkest night, the moonless night. That's how difficult it is. And that's how much discernment we require combined with ruthlessness, total ruthlessness against any of our manifestations of egotism, pride, vanity, and all these things. Ujub is one of the most dangerous of all vices, of being good, of doing good, and then being proud of yourself for being good. And then, as Imam Ali says, one of the best ways in which shaitan gets rid, effaces, wipes out the ihsan of the muhsini is by having a person flatter you. If you are flattered by somebody, then shaitan, according to Imam Ali in his letter to Malik al-Ashtar, he said, beware of these flatterers, because when you're flattered and when you're praised, this is one of the best opportunities for shaitan to efface, to wipe out, to annul the ihsan, the virtue of the muhsineen, of those who have virtue. So you see the subtlety of all this and the corresponding degree of rigor, and I would use the word again, ruthlessness, lack of mercy. You have to, you must not be merciful to yourself at all when you're confronted with the viciousness and the ugliness of your own egotism and pride, which are manifested symbolically in the Quran as a, a Pharaoh or an Abu Lahab or this or that. So that is why these things are unforgivable. The Prophet said that for the true believer, the smallest mistake rises up and becomes a mountain of sin in his view. That he does not want to tolerate even the smallest mistake. For him, it becomes a huge sin. And Imam Ali reinforces this idea in many, many places, in particular when he talks about the true intellectual as being the one who is the strongest against his own soul, against his own desires, against his own predilections, which are in contradiction to the divine uh, will for all of us. So uh, I think I've probably spoken enough on that. Should we have another question? Yes, thank you. That explains this very well. Uh, we'll take one uh, one more question. Uh, Dr. Isa, you have touched upon this already in your presentation. Uh, please, if you can further elaborate on how is the notion of Tanzil distinct from that of Tajalli? Tanzil and Tajalli. Uh, or was it Tawil and Tajalli? Tanzil and Tajalli. Right. Um, well, one of the ways I, I used to um, try and express this. All right, let's think of it this way. The, uh, the tanzil of the Quran can be understood as revelation, the descent, um, with the idea of self-disclosure implicit whereas tajalli is self-disclosure with the idea of descent and revolution and revelation implicit so it's just uh, uh, there are two sides of the same coin you might say but sometimes you, you can't say that well let me just think um, yes when god talks about um, when, when Moses asks to see God, um, God says, you will not see me. Lantarani. Well, I can offer il al Jabal, but look at the mountain. If it stays in its place, when I reveal myself to it, then you will see me. And it says, Tajalla, God revealed himself to the mountain and it crumbled. And Moses fell down in a swoon, completely unconscious. That such is the um, brilliance, the blinding light of God's tajalli, that 
we can't take it without, as the prophet said, 70,000 veils of light and darkness through which God's tajalli manifests to us. So tajalli and zuhur are virtually synonymous. That self-disclosure of God, zuhur means making manifest what is the batin. So when God says, God's zuhur, his zahir aspect, is a self-disclosure, a tajalli of the batin, of what's hidden. But tanzil, it, the, the, the idea of nazala is to come down. A manzil is a place where you live because it's a place where you alight, you come down off your horse or your camel and you stay there. So that's a manzil, it's a, it's a place of, of residing after you've come down from somewhere. And uh, but tajalli is related to the idea of revealing light and if you look at the verses of the quran we had that one tajalli lamma tajalla and then you have in the surah ashams in the surah of the sun wa shamsi wa duhaha wa qamari idha talaha wa nahari idha jallaha by the sun and its brightness by the moon when it follows her and by the day when it makes the sun resplendent, it brings the sun's light into being, the daytime. When Nahari Ida Jallaha, it brings. So Jalla, as we said with Imam Ali, Jalla is to polish something um, until it becomes capable of reflecting the light. It brings, it takes off the dust of the surface of something and light. It can be managed, can be reflected from it. So, and similarly, Allayli uh, ida yaksha wa nahari ida tajalla. By the, the surah after the surah Shams, the surah Layl, the surah of the night. By the night, as it shroudeth, it closes, it makes things dark. Nahari ida tajalla, exactly the same word for, we have for tajalli. Tajalla when the day manifests itself, it reveals the light that is present implicitly within it and in night, but in the daytime that which is hidden comes into into disclosure, comes into vision. So you, you see the sunlight again. I think that's probably um, yeah, I think that's probably enough. Should we have one more question? Uh, yes, Dr. Isa, we can go with one more for the last one. Uh, can you please tell us a little about the spiritual teachings of Imam Ali and his influence on Sufism? That's, uh, that is a big one, but if you can maybe um, you know, give us a little bit of a brief on it. Thank you. Uh, all right, well, I'll answer Karachi. Um, all of you know the great um, Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan and the Kowali Ali 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 Mullah Ali Ali. All you have to do if you want to see the influence of Imam Ali on Sufism and you know for, for within Sufism it's predominantly a Sunni phenomenon. And Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan was a Sunni follower of the Chishti Sufi Tariqa and is very representative. What he says in that, and I, I'm not sure where he gets the lyrics from, but when he refers to Imam Ali and says, Qasam khuda ki Ali nabi se, nabi Ali se joda nahi hai. I swear by God that the Prophet is not separate from Ali, Ali is not separate from the Prophet. And then this great, I think this, the, the, the magnificent centerpiece of this um, Kowali is. Um, uh, Everyone look at Ali. This is a command of the Prophet. Look at Ali. Because the Prophet says this is ibadat. This is worship. Just looking at the face of Ali. And this is a great hadith that's accepted in Sunni sources. And influence the whole of Sufism as regards, if you like, bringing into Sufism the very same 
principle that is expressed in Hinduism as darshan, the vision of God through the face of a saint, of a holy person. So as the Prophet said in a hadith that was related by no less an authority than Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he was seen to be looking at the face of Ali and his daughter, Sayyidatna Aisha radiallahu anha, said, why are you looking at the face of Ali like this? And he said, because I heard the Prophet say, looking at the face of Ali is an act of worship. So what Nusrat is saying in the 20th century is just a prolongation of the or projection of what has taken place through the whole of the Islamic tradition, through its Sufi, its mystical and metaphysical traditions, that Imam Ali's degree of spiritual realization, of tahakkuk, of tawheed, of oneness, of his vision of God, which transforms his whole being and not just his mind and his visible heart. The whole being has been transformed. And that is the perspective of the Sufis throughout the length and breadth of the Muslim world from the beginning up until now. That they would regard Imam Ali as the gateway to the consciousness of the Prophet, as the Mola of all those who are seeking initiation and into the mystical path, that in his sayings, I mean, Imam Junaid of Baghdad, he referred to Imam Ali as Shaykhuna Fil Usul Wal Bala. Now, Junaid is regarded as a pivotal personage in the development of the Sufi tariqas. The, the, most of the Sufi silsilas go to Junaid and from Junaid to his uncle Sariya Sakati and then Ma'ruf al Karhi and then Imam Ali ibn Musa al Rida up through the Imams, up to Imam Ali, and then they all go back to Imam Ali, even the Rakshbandis have Silsila Dhahabiya, which is they call the, the golden chain. And even that chain, I mean, even the Rakshbandis, who were traditionally regarded as the sole exception, that all the other tariqas go to the Prophet through Ali, but not the Rakshbandis. That's not true. The Rakshbandis did have a Silsila going from the Prophet to Abu Bakr, but another one called the golden chain, through the line of the 12 Imams, from Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida up to Imam Ali and then to the Prophet. So all of the Sufi tariqas, without exception, see Imam Ali as the fountainhead of the walaya that is muktasaba for them after the authority of the Holy Prophet. And when the Prophet said, this is your mawla, if you regard me as your mawla, then this man is your mawla. Then what came from the Prophet to Ali and then from Ali to his disciples and down through all of the traditions of Islamic spirituality, they all looked to Imam Ali as this, this pinnacle and, and of what is achievable for all of them. And he made man, we, none of us can give ourselves to God with spiritual discipline to the point where we become prophets. But all of us have not just the right, but perhaps the duty to emulate the uh, insan al-kamil, to become a waliullah ourselves, that that is something we can acquire. And that is what the Sufi tariqas is all about, acquiring, obtaining that degree of walaya through divine grace that can be earned as a result of your spiritual discipline and in proportion to your ikhlas. And this is why throughout, I mean, you just have to look at what Rumi says in that famous incident when at the end of the Masnavi book one, he has a really long section on Imam Ali about the man who spat Amr ibn al-Wud. He spat in the face of Imam Ali just before in a battle when Ali was about to dispatch him. And Imam Ali drew back and Rumi immortalizes this incident, saying that Imam Ali was not going to kill someone out of personal anger at the fact that he'd been spat in the face and that his mother had been cursed. He stood back and he was in complete control of himself. And Rumi says, how could this have happened, this spit, that the person spat in the face of the iftikhar um, har vali or har nabi? the pride of every prophet and every saint. 
That's how Rumi describes Imam Ali, again a Sunni. This doesn't, this comes from Sufism, not from a Shia theology. It comes from Shia, it comes from Sunni Sufism, that Imam Ali's face is regarded as the pride, that in which legitimate pride is taken by every prophet and every saint. And an almost identical thing you find with uh, Ibn Arabi, the Shaykh al Akbar. In the Futuhat al Makiya, he describes Imam Ali in one of the editions, and the other one is not there for some reason. But in one of the um, editions, of the earliest editions of the Futuhat al Makiya, it says that he's the Imam al Alam Wasir al Anbiya. That, that Ali in the primordial cloud preceding cre creation, the closest thing to the prophetic reality within the cloud that contained the cosmos was Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he is then described as Imam al Alam, the Imam of the whole world, Wasir al Anbiya, the mystery, the secret of all of the prophets. So you see again, not coming from Shia theology, both Ibn Arabi and Rumi were quite critical of Shiism in various manifestations and some of their theology. But when it came to Ali Abi Talib and the Ahl al-Bayt generally, there's no difference. This is what I tried to argue in my latest book. Mm -hmm. I hope you know it's there's no difference between a Sufi, Sunni emulation and devotion to Ahl al-Bayt, to Imam Ali and the Ahl al-Bayt, and the, the Shia devotion to the Ahl al-Bayt. The root is absolutely one and the same. So I think we can probably stop there. Thank you, Dr. Reza. Yes, You're I think welcome. that's the last one that we'll take. Uh, Dr. Reza, with immense gratitude, I thank you on behalf of Idra for Pakistan for engaging us today in such an enlightening, intellectually stimulating and humbling session this evening. Thank you. Thank you. God Last week, I thank our audience, each and every one of you who has joined us live today, requesting you once again to fill out the feedback forms. The link can be seen on the screen. For any of you who may have questions regarding this session, you can drop us an email on the ID shown on the screen. Our team will respond to you accordingly. And before leaving the session tonight, please do subscribe to our channel. Thank you and Khuda Hafiz. Khuda Hafiz.